here to talk about my favorite subject, which is the heart. Now, the reason why I love the heart is because there's not much in medicine that one scares people more than ultrasound in the heart. Or, but really taking care of people with chest pain and those kind of things is really kind of a hard thing for us to do because think about it, what kind of physical exam can you really do on the heart? It's pretty challenging, right? It's covered up by bones and air and you can't feel it and who's good at listening to it? <laughs> Not me, okay? So with ultrasound, we get to visualize it. So we're gonna talk a little about this, but the other thing is, is once you understand how the heart functions, you really gonna understand cardiac physiology. So this is gonna be fun. So stay with me for a couple minutes and we're gonna make this, this can make this interesting. So me and Dan, we switched places this week. <laughs> And because he's probably going to watch me and see how I did this, I get to say, hey, I really like the outtakes. That was funny. It made me laugh. We have a good time doing this. Y'all y'all like them? Yes. Okay. So it makes us have a good time. And, you know, we ask you to come up with a differential diagnosis. And the reason we ask you to do that, because we want to open your brain. We want to open your mind. So what's some of the things you came up with? <laughs> so long ago. Come on. What you got? Myocardial infarction. You really can't be wrong, so say whatever. PE. -E. Pericarditis. Tamponade. Pneumothorax. Costochondritis. Broken rib, right? Strained muscle. How about anxiety, right? We could come up with a million things, right? And that's the whole point of why we do this. I mean, this is not a hard pretest. Everybody agree with that? But we have to give you a pretest. But that, but, but really, tests and things like that should help you learn something. And what we're trying to do with this is open your mind and think about all the things it could be so that when we start teaching you stuff, you see how to narrow things down, all right? Because that's what makes good doctors, okay? Now, when it comes to the heart, like I said, there could be lots of things that are wrong. I mean, any of those things can cause pain. And what happens is, is us clinicians, we think that it's costochondritis and it's really a heart attack, and then we send people home and then they die. So you don't want to miss that. But then again, you can't treat every chest pain like it's a myocardial infarction. I mean, we, we couldn't afford that. You would be subjecting to a lot of people to a lot of workups that they didn't need. So it takes some diagnostic kind of know-how to figure this out. And so that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. You know, with ultrasound, I really like it because, you know, we get to do it as clinicians. That, that's good. But think about, again, that physical exam. How good, how good are we with our stethoscope? What about that feeling for a PMI, right? The PMI is where the tip of the heart is. How good are we with that? Well, maybe we can feel it, but what does it mean? Doesn't mean a whole lot, right? But with ultrasound, you're about to see that we can see a lot of life-threatening diagnoses, and we can correlate it to the patient's symptoms, and we have a better idea of what's going on with them. And so that's what we're going to do. And if you look at the board up there, you know, this is where we're going. You guys are in this first poster. We're doing the FAST exam. That's really what we're focusing in on. Y'all don't realize it, but that's what we're doing. But the second year, the end of next year, where you're going to be doing the RUSH exam. And then you're going to take that and you're going to go out into the clinical experiences. And in the fourth year, you're going to be using the RUSH exam to diagnose people in shock. All right, so that's going to be really cool. You're going to be using, you're going to be using the tools we've given you over four years and you're going to be coming up with diagnosis and people you'll really be saving people's lives. And that's where heart comes in. The heart is the centerpiece of the rush exam. So you have to be able to do the heart to figure out what kind of shock somebody has. And we're gonna start that a little bit today. But once you know what kind of shock they have, then you can use this heart exam we're gonna teach you to know if you're making the patient better or worse by your therapy. That's called goal-directed therapy. Are they getting better with what you're doing? If you're doing that, maybe you should do more of it. Are they getting worse? Maybe you shouldn't do what you're doing. Maybe you should do something different. And so that's what we're going to go through is trying to help you understand how those things go so that all of y'all will be the best clinicians you can be. Now, click. These are the only two things I expect you to know from today, okay? So I want you to know what you're looking at when you look at the heart, all right? because it's not going to have labels on it. In fact, y'all have to put labels on it. It's not going to have labels on it. So I want you to know what you're looking at. And then the other thing, I want you to understand how the heart is a pump and how you can use that to answer a lot of questions on tests and get them right, but more importantly, how you can go up to somebody that has some symptom and know exactly what's going on with them. This is really inside information. This is what, what I've been told from through the week is, is that I'm going to really put together what Dr. Brands taught you, okay? So hold tight with me just for a second. That's all we're really doing. But I'm going to teach you a lot of stuff. But that's really all I want you to know, okay? Now, when we started talking the very first lab, both Dan and I told you, we don't, I don't really want you to focus in on the nuts and bolts. I don't want you to focus in on orientation. Now, Becky will tell you if you got, got things backwards, okay? Because we want you to do things right. 
But as a clinician, I don't really care if you have it backwards. What I care about is you know what you're looking at, all right? So when we, I didn't show you this the first couple times because you were doing, um, you know, musculoskeletal stuff and vital signs. I mean, it didn't make as much of a difference. But when, if you take the transducer and you hold it right up on top of the screen, the transducer has a mark on it. Now this one on the screen has a dot, but the ones back there that you're going to use have a line on them. That line indicates right and left. So if you look on the screen, there's an indicator there too, okay? So I'll put a dot up here so they'd match, all right? So if you hold that transducer right on top of that, that is the same orientation. It's like taking that transducer and sticking that screen right into somebody's body, all right? So in other words, if, if you touch this side of the transducer and it's the right side, you're on the right side of the patient's body, okay? And we always orient it that way or towards the head, okay? Does that make sense? All right, I don't want you to get too caught up in this. I just want you to realize that if you take the transducer and you hold it up there and it's right, you know, you touch the dot and the dots are all lined up and you stick it on the patient, it is right. In other words, it is correct. It is to the right. Now, cardiac orientation, which we're about to do next, is different. The dot actually is on the other side. Now, that can get people all confused in their head. They start going, which way do I turn the transducer? I don't want you to think that way. What I want you to think is I just match the dots up and I stick it on the patient, okay? If I'm going across the belly or across the chest, okay? So I just do whatever the machine is and I sit it on top of the patient and it's going to be right. And if I don't do it that way, it goes towards the patient's head. Does that make sense? Do not get all stressed about this. This is easy stuff. Just do what the machine tells you. Sit it on the patient and it'll be correct, okay? Now, we're gonna teach you a couple ways to look at the heart. There's a lot, there's reasons, I'm gonna tell you why in just a second, why there's different ways of looking at the heart. But what we're gonna focus on today is subcostal and a parasternal where we come on the top. Now, I'm recording this so they can't see me because I didn't get, I didn't record this. So I'm gonna show you so you get inside information. If they didn't show up, they don't get this, okay? So, I want you to imagine my thumb is my inferior vena cava. Right? Where does the inferior vena cava go through? What organ? <coughs> the liver, right? So if I put that through my liver, my hand is like my heart. Does that make sense? So the inferior vena cava comes into what part of my heart? The liver is next to what part of my heart, right or left? Right. right. All right. So if this is the right part of my heart and I take my ultrasound beam and shine it this way, the right ventricle is up close to the transducer. Does that make sense? And what is further away or deeper on the screen? This part of the heart, which is the, the left part of the heart. So this is right and this is left and the IVC comes into the right atrium. Does that make sense? Now, if I shine this way again, which, which part of the heart is at the top of the screen? Right side of the heart. And then the left is deeper on the screen, right? Now, imagine that I take my transducer and I come up on top of the heart like this. Which part of the heart now am I seeing on the screen? the left part of the heart, okay? I'm gonna go through this again about three times because I want everybody to get this right. But do you see how you can visualize what you're doing? You see the bottom part of the heart, now we come up on the top, we see the left part of the heart. Does that make sense? All right, so we're gonna do that a couple of times. I'm gonna go through it. You're gonna get bored of me saying it. All right, but I just wanted you to see what we're gonna do. Now, when we go into the room, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take your transducer, orient it like I showed you, and just put it straight on the person's belly, right, right below their xiphoid, okay? Now, when I do that, I'm cutting straight through my body. What do you think I'm gonna see at the bottom part of the screen? Not the kidney, spine, okay? The spine, do you see why I'd see the spine? I'm just cutting straight through. I'm gonna see the spine, right? You agree? All right, so there's only two things me and Dan want you to know about in ultrasound. Now, imagine all your other classes if they said, we only want you to know two things, right? This is the only things we'll ever ask you to absolutely know. That's the spine and the liver. That's all we'll ask you to ever know, all right? Why? Because if you know the spine, bright and shadow, everybody see that? Bright and shadow. If you know the spine, you know the back, right? So anterior, posterior, right? There's nothing back here we care about. So anterior and posterior, there's the spine. And liver, everybody see the liver? It's the biggest organ in the abdomen, the liver. The liver tells you right and left. 
So even if you get the orientation wrong, you still should know what you're looking at because the spine tells you back, anterior, posterior, and liver tells you right and left. So let me show you how to use this. So you got two tubes running up the spine. What two tubes run up the spine? Aorta and IVC, right? Aorta and IVC run up the spine. Everybody agree? Y'all go. Yeah, trust me, the aorta runs up the spine and the IVC runs right beside it. So aorta and IVC run up the spine. How, which one goes through the liver, the IVC or the aorta? IVC. So that's the IVC, so that has to be the aorta. Do you see how we figured that out? I didn't ask you to know anything but the spine and the liver, but you know because you're, you're, you're pre-doctors. You know that there's two tubes around the spine, the aorta and the IVC, and the IVC goes through the liver, so that has to be the aorta. That's the way we're going to do everything this year, okay, and next year, and for the rest of your life, okay? You don't have to know everything. You just have to know how to figure it out. It's the same thing when we do with differential diagnosis. You don't always have to know everything about every disease. You just have to know which one's more likely, okay, and then figure it out. Now, let's apply this to the heart, okay? So I said you only have to know two things. Well, I'm still say that. So right now, see the transducers pointed straight back towards the back. So what do we see? We see spine, liver, two tubes. Which one is that? IVC. Now, the IVC goes into what part of the heart? Right atrium. So look, we're, we're taking our transducer and we're pointing it straight back towards the back. We're pointing it straight down. Everybody agree? To look at the heart, I've got to look with my flashlight or my ultrasound transducer up underneath the ribs. That's why it's called subcostal. Does that make sense? So I'm going to take and I'm going to tilt and follow the IVC up into the heart, just like that. You ready? All right, here we go. It's going to start right here. I'm going to follow it up into the heart, up, 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 up. There's the right atrium. Okay, it's going to do it again. So all I'm doing is starting straight up, finding the spine, the liver, making sure I know which one's the IVC and then following the IVC up into the heart. So here we go, up, up, there's the diaphragm, we're going through the diaphragm, right atrium. Okay, did everybody get that? Told you I was gonna tell you like three times. Now, when we talk about windows, windows are pictures into the body, ways you can look into the body. What are the enemies of ultrasound? We've talked about this many times. What are the enemies of ultrasound? Bone, air, and what's the last one? Distance. What's the, it, what's the friend of ultrasound? Fluid. So bone distance and air are enemies. So we got to see the heart. What is the heart covered up by? Bone. bone and air. So it's covered up by all the enemies and we can't see through enemies. So windows, I don't want you to think about the name so much. What I want you to think about is those are areas where we know we can see through things into the chest so we can see the heart. Okay, we're essentially we're looking around the bones in the air. So subcostal, you just saw why we, we went subcostal. Why do we go subcostal? Because we're going through the liver and the heart touches the liver. So we're not getting in into any lungs. Does that make sense? So when you think about the windows, don't think about exactly what you're doing, because remember, everybody's heart's in a different location, right? So my heart, remember, they taught you in physical diagnosis, the PMI is over near the nipple, right? That's if you're normal. Well, what if you're tall and skinny or you got COPD? Your heart's going to be fairly vertical. It's going to be down. Or what if you have um, a big beer belly? Your heart's going to be flat up here, right? You see? So you can't always take the transducer and stick it exactly where I tell you and see the heart. And this is what we've had trouble with this week, so I want to say it. If you stick the transducer onto the chest or onto the abdomen and you don't see the heart, you've got to move the transducer around because you're just seeing air, all right? you haven't found the window. Until you see the heart beating, you're not seeing the heart. Once you see the heart beating, you want to make it look right, okay? So when we come up sub -xiphoid, we've got our transducer across the belly. It's going the same way it is on the screen, so it's going that way. And we see a four-chamber view of the heart. Now, how do we know the difference between the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart besides it's labeled? How do we know? Liver is next to which side? right and we look for the tube coming through the liver and it goes to the right atrium and then you know all of the chambers okay so here's how that works right so we're coming up underneath we're looking up underneath the ribs we see the liver so this is the right side of the heart everybody agree and what's this thing coming through the liver have you see and it goes into what 
right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium. What's this thing in between the left ventricle and left atrium? And what about that one? You see how you figure it out with no labels? That's how you figure it out. You just don't look at it and go, I know what that is. You go, this is the right side of the heart because it's next to the liver. This is the IVC, so it's right atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium, mitral valve, tricuspid valve. Same way I do it. Got it? Okay. Should not be hard. Now, while we're there, we, you just saw we looked at the IVC just a second ago. Well, we like to look at the IVC instead of like that circle or short axis. See how this is a circle? We like to twist on it so instead of seeing it as a cross section, we see it as a long axis like a pipe. Okay? So we turn our transducer from flat. Remember we were going right, left? We turn it north, south, up and down the body. Remember, the IVC runs up and down the body. And we're looking for two parallel lines. Now, there's another tube over there, that other pipe. What's that other pipe? The aorta. So how do you know the difference once you've turned long axis and it's just two parallel lines, the difference between the IVC and the aorta? Does anybody want to guess? What did I tell you the IVC goes through? The liver. So the IVC goes through the liver, the aorta does not. Also, the aorta is on top of the spine. What does the spine look like? It's bright and shadow. So if you see bright and shadow below the structure, that's the aorta. The liver, if you see the liver, it looks like it's on both sides, and that's the IVC. And we also look for the hepatic vein. So I'm going to show you that next. So we start off flat. There's the IVC. Now we're going to turn our transducer up and down the body and pan to the patient's right. And we see this two parallel lines. This is the IVC going through the liver, and this is the hepatic vein coming into it. Okay? That's how you know you're looking at the IVC. So one more time. So we turn it north-south, and we pan to the right. This is two parallel lines. This is the IVC. This is the hepatic vein coming in. It's going into the right atrium. Is that cool? All right. One last thing we need to learn how to think about, okay? This is not 100% always true, but on a test, it's always true, okay? So this helps you out when you're on a test. In real life, you have to think about some nuances because not everything in real, in real life always works, but on tests, this always works, okay? Size and pressure are the same thing. Right? In other words, I'm telling you size, which is volume, and pressure are the same. So if the size is bigger, then the pressure is more. If the size is smaller, the pressure is less. Okay? You understand? All right? Think about this. This is a diver, right? So is the pressure higher at his head or is it flippers? At his head because you have more volume on top of the head than you have above the flippers. You see the difference? So volume and pressure are the same thing, or size and pressure are the same thing, okay? Now, if you're an engineer and you studied this kind of stuff, you know it's not, but let's just say it is for now, okay? You'll see how this works in a second. So here's the inferior vena cava coming through the liver. Everybody agree? And look at the IVC. It gets bigger and it gets smaller. Why is it getting bigger and smaller? It's getting bigger and smaller because the pressure is going up and down. Okay? Pressure's going up and down. I just told you pressure and size are the same thing. Okay? So when we breathe in, what do we do? We pull our diaphragm down and we pull our ribs out. And what does that make? It makes a vacuum in our chest. And so we pull air into our lungs. Everybody agree? And when we do that, we also pull blood out of our inferior vena cava. So the pressure drops. It gets smaller. So that's why the IVC gets bigger and smaller. Is that cool? Okay, so follow along with me for a second. Now, who, who, who knows CPR in here? Everybody, right? So you remember when you're sitting there doing chest compressions? Are you doing chest compressions to make the heart be a pump and you're pushing the heart in and out? No. What you're doing is you're making that chest act like a vacuum. It's pushing blood out of the chest, and you re let the chest recoil. It pulls blood out of the IVC back into the heart, pushing it out and pulling it out. You're pushing, you're changing the chest compression, the chest size to pull blood in and out of the chest. Does that make sense? All right. Now, we're going to use that knowledge in just a minute because the IVC is the tank of the body. So that's where we store our extra fluid. So when we go out running the Georgia heat, we get dehydrated, that tank gets small because we're sweating it out. Then you go drink two gallons of Gatorade. It, de it doesn't all immediately go in the tissues. It gets in your plasma. That's where we store it, okay? And we're going to use that in just a second. Now, if we're coming this way, remember, if we're coming this way, which side of the heart do we see the best at the top of the screen? 
the right side. The left side is further away. So if we come up on top of the chest up here, which side of the heart do we see? Left. All right. Now, when we come down, when we're down here, subxiphoid, remember I told you the probe is across. When we come up here, we angle it towards the head. Okay? Now, remember I told you everybody's heart could be a different way, right? It could be hanging down, it could be normal, it could be up like this. So I don't know how to tell you to turn the transducer. So I have to, you have to make the picture look right. In other words, if the heart is being cut in cross section, it looks like a zero or a circle. Okay? But you know you've seen the heart, it looks like a cone, right? So if we want to see the long axis of the cone, we have to turn the transducer to make the ventricle look like a C. Okay, you see how it looks like a C? If it's not a C, then you need to twist it just a little bit more. So in other words, if you turn the transducer in a complete circle around and around and around, it'll go between a C and an O. C and an O, okay? A long axis is when it's a C. All right, that allows you to see into that whole cone. Does that make sense? All right, so remember which side of the heart do we see when we come up top? The left. So all we really see is the left side of structures. We don't really see much of the right side of structures. We can ignore them, okay? But the left ventricle looks like this C. Here's the left atrium, mitral valve, aortic valve, ascending aorta. So in other words, we, blood comes in here through the pulmonary veins goes out the left atrium through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, then it squeezes and it goes out the aorta. Everybody understands that, right? Now, a couple things to, to look at here. What's this bright thing with shadow behind it in the back? It's the same thing we looked at down here. Spine, and then you got a tube running up the spine. What is that? Descending aorta. So this is the ascending aorta, but what happens is the aorta comes up and it turns and it comes back down the spine. So we can't see that arch, but we can see two parts of the aorta. Does that make sense? So if you're not a 3D person, you don't have to be a 3D person to think about that twisting. You just have to recognize what you see. Remember, I only asked you to know the spine and the liver. That's the spine. You got a tube running up it. That must be the aorta. Okay? And then we made this a C, so we know this is the left ventricle. Okay? So let's do that ourselves. So what is this chamber here? The left atrium. What's this valve? Mitral valve. You know it has to be because it's only the left side of the heart. What's this? What's this? And this is the ascending aorta. Okay? Y'all good? All right. Now, now there, we teach you two different views. The reason we teach you two different views is because there's advantages. So when we were coming subcostally, we could see the IVC and the right side of the heart really good. Those are useful structures. We're going to learn them in a minute. But remember, distance is our enemy, so we don't see the left side so well, and that's really the part we care about. So that's why we teach you this other view where you come up on top because you're real close to the transducer. You can see all those structures well, real well. Can everybody see the valve really well? How about these other structures in here? What are those? Those little lines connected to the valve. Chordae tendinae and papillary muscles. You see that? So you can't see them as well over here. Okay? And then, again, the IVC, we, we can sh look at it in cross-section, but we like to look at it in long axis, okay? Because then we can see how much it's collapsing. All right. That's enough of the anatomy. Y'all ready for the fun stuff? I won't teach you if you don't want to know. If you want to know, right? Yeah, okay. This is actually fun stuff. All right? So this is what I told you I wanted you to remember. I want you to remember that the heart is nothing but a pump, okay? Heart is nothing but a pump. But it's really m two pumps, okay? There's a left-sided pump and a right-sided pump. So when we look at the heart, we've got to remember we're looking at two sides of a pump. We're looking at the right side of the pump. The right side of the pump goes to which side? What, to what organs? The lungs. And the left side of the pump goes to everything else, right? So you've got to remember there's two different structures there. So you, if you're looking at the heart, we could have a blockage in one side or the other or a problem with one side or the other, and it's going to give us a differential in our symptoms that we're looking for. Or maybe it doesn't. Let's check it out. So let's say that your heart, you, you have coronary artery disease, and your heart dies. And now your left ventricle, see this is a peristernal long, it looks like a C. It's not squeezing so much. Everybody agree it's not squeezing? So if it's not squeezing and you're still putting blood in it, what happens to the pressure in the left ventricle? It goes up. If the pressure goes up in the left ventricle, what happens to the size? 
gets bigger. Everybody agree it's bigger? If the pressure is higher in the left ventricle, what happens to the pressure in the left atrium? It goes up too, right? And what happens to the size of the left atrium? It also goes up. Now, there's the pulmonary veins coming in here. If the pressure is high in the left atrium, what's, what's the pressure in the, left, in the pulmonary veins? Higher, all right? Now, this is a good principle. I didn't, this is not one of the ones I told you to remember, but remember that pulmonary veins or any vein that has high pressure leaks. So if the pressure goes up in the left atrium and it's going up in the pulmonary veins, where is the fluid leaking? In the lungs, and what do we call those symptoms? Not hypertension, pulmonary edema, congestion, pulmonary edema. So they get short of breath, okay? Now, the heart's a closed system, right? So it's still tied all together. So if the pressure's high in the left ventricle, this is subcostal, so this is the right side, this is the left side. So if the pressure's high in the left ventricle, it's pr pressure's high in the left atrium, pressure's high in the pulmonary veins, where else is the pressure high? and the right ventricle and the right atrium. Where does fluid back up if the pressure's high in the right atrium? In the IVC, exactly. So the IVC, remember I told you size and pressure are the same thing. See, the IVC is big and dilated, so the pressure's high. If the pressure's high in the IVC, and I told you that when the pressure's high, you leak, where do you see fluid when it's high in the IVC? In the legs. So that's why you have swelling of the legs. Does that make sense? It's two sides of the pump. Now let's take it a little bit differently. So what happens if your systemic circulation is you're really high? So you have a blood pressure of 210 over 100 for 10 years. What's going to happen to your muscles as you exercise them with high weights all the time? They go hypertrophy. So do you see that the wall is super thick? This is left ventricular hypertrophy due to hypertension. It's called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a little different than what I told you before, but if, if you can imagine this one's real easy, how easy do you think it is to get blood into this small cavity that's now taken up by all this muscle? Is it harder or easier? Harder. Is it harder to relax that muscle or easier? Harder. So is the pressure higher or lower to get blood in here? Higher. So pressure higher or lower in the right atrium? Higher. So if it's higher in the right atrium, where, what about the pulmonary veins? Higher. What symptoms do you think they have? Pulmonary edema. And then it's going to back up into the left side, I mean the right side also. What else will they have? Leg swelling. So how do you know the difference between pulmonary hypertension that's because there's been ischemia and it just can't squeeze versus they can really squeeze because it's super strong? How do you know the difference? Clinically, that's right. How do you know the difference clinically? I just told you they both had shortness of breath and leg swelling. It's very hard. It took me 15 years and a lot of ultrasound to realize the difference between diastolic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, heart failure, versus dilated ischemic cardiomyopathy, heart failure, systolic heart failure. Those are different. I don't expect you to know the difference, but you see how they look the same, but with a look the same clinically, but they look different by ultrasound, you can tell really quick. Does that make sense? You see how they're different? Man, it, I don't know if Dr. Brands tried to explain that to you, but it's really hard without pictures, I can tell you that. All right, what about if all of a sudden you had a big blockage in the, in the pulmonary circulation? What would happen to the heart? What do you expect would happen? Not hypertrophy, let's just say dilation because the pressure will go up, right? So pressure would go up on the right side, so it would dilate. Remember, because I told you pressure and volume are the same. What would happen to the left side? Not atrophy, but just small, right? You agree? You all think that that's what's going to happen? Let's take a look. So this is liver, so this is the right side. See how big and dilated it is? And now we go look at the left side. See how small it is? So the right's a lot bigger than the left. Which side should be bigger in the heart, the right or the left? The left should be bigger because it's higher pressure, right? Remember I told you pressure and volume the same? So it should be bigger because it's higher pressure. In this case, the right side is big and dilated and the left is small. Did that make sense, what you thought? That's cool, huh? What causes an acute blockage of the lungs? Pulmonary embolism, there it is. All right, see how you figured it out? Now it's a big one, all right? Not small ones, big ones. All right, what would it look like if your aortic valve 
you had m rheumatic heart disease or something and your aortic valve was really strictured, it was small, it wouldn't open up, what would happen to the pressure in the left ventricle? It'd go up, and what would the size of the left ventricle do? Go up. What would the left atrium do? And look how huge it is. <laughs> it would increase also. See how big it is? What symptoms would you have? Pulmonary edema and peripheral edema. Same thing again. Are you shocked that you keep getting the same symptoms? I'm not. <laughs> what about if your valve, your aortic valve, was leaky? Instead of being strictured, it was leaky. So you see the blood going back across the valve. That The color is flow. So we're in diastole, and there's flow back across the aortic valve. So the left ventricle, it's getting extra volume. If it gets extra volume, it's getting it from the across the mitral valve and back across the aortic valve, what's the pressure go happening in the left ventricle? Goes up. If the pressure goes up there, what happens to the pressure in the left atrium? What symptoms do you have? Shortness of breath and peripheral edema. Same thing again, isn't it? But you see how you can tell the difference between aortic regurg and aortic stenosis by ultrasound, but very hard by clinical exam? Are y'all having fun? All right, can't tell, it's Friday. All right, here's a little different one. It's harder to see, but this is a, um, the same parasternal. So this is the left ventricle. This is the mitral valve. See the flow coming back across the mitral valve? Do you think that the pressure here would be affected if you're losing? If it, well, but it's probably not high. I mean, you're losing pressure, so it's still going out. But what about the pressure in the left atrium? Goes up. Do you think that that would cause the pulmonary veins to have higher pressure and all the way back around like we talked about? It'd be the same thing again. You see that? All right, here's one last one. One last one, we'll go, and y'all go scan. So remember I told you fluid, if it has volume, it has pressure. So if you have fluid around the heart, pericardial effusion, it has pressure. And remember the heart fills, the, left, the right side fills with kind of passively. Right? Remember I told you breathe in and breathe out. It's being pulled in. Well, if you got fluid around the heart, if that pressure exceeds the pressure coming into the heart, the heart can't fill. So look at the right ventricle. Is it filling with blood? No. Why is it not filling with blood? Because this pressure is higher than the pressure to fill the right ventricle. If you don't fill the right ventricle with blood, what happens to the pressure in the left atrium? Goes down, right? If the left atrial pressure goes down, what happens to the left ventricle pressure? Goes down. What happens to your blood pressure if the left ventricle pressure goes down? It drops too. What do we call that? Hypotension, but pericardial tamponade. That's tamponade. When your blood pressure falls because the pressure around the heart won't let it fill. Did I put together some of the things Dr. Brown was trying to teach you? Did you understand it a little bit? Did it help at all? Because we don't really know how to teach all this. I'm trying to figure it out. Did it help? Yeah. Did you have fun? Yeah. All right. So when you go in there, what are you going to do? You're going to hold your transducer up against the screen, and you go orient. You're going to put it straight on the abdomen. What are you looking for? The two organs I told you you only needed to know, which is spine and aorta, uh, liver. <laughs> spine tells you the back and front, and liver tells you right and left, okay? And then you're going to follow the IVC, which is the tube that goes through the liver that you should see, and you're going to follow it up into the heart. That tells you right side from left side, right atrium from right ventricle. Then you're going to do up and down. So you've got two parallel lines. You're going to look at the IVC, and then you go pop up over the heart. And what part of the heart is it when you pop up over? The left side. And you're trying to make the left look like what letter? A C. And you will have it all right. Y'all have a nice weekend.